In this problem, we see another anvil impact. Uh, but in this case, we're going to have both a spring and a damper involved in the oscillations after the top impacts the anvil. So our ultimate goal is we want to find the position of this anvil and top after they combine after the impact. We want to know their position at all points in time after that impact. So we want to know, I'll be calling it x of t for that position, and we'll see in the diagram what how x of t is defined. And we are given uh, a lot of information here. We're told about the weight of the hammer, the weight of the anvil, the stiffness of the spring that the anvil sits on, the stiffness of the damper that it sits on as well. And that's going to go into our modeling step. All right, so in order to get x of t, we're going to need to have an equation of motion. We're going to need to solve it using our initial conditions. So we're going to follow the same procedure that we have for the undamped problems, but now we're going to have damping in it. All right, so we are going to assume or limit this problem that this anvil and the top can only move in this vertical direction here. There's not going to be horizontal motion. There's not going to be twisting. So this is ultimately what our final model is going to look like. It's going to be a mass on a spring and a damper. It's going to be a simple spring mass damper system. Right, so this M, K, and C are going to be the equivalent values once we simplify our system down. But really, what's the system we're looking at? Well, again, we have to define our system. We, the system is only going to oscillate after this top impacts and sticks to the anvil, kind of like the undamped problem that was pretty similar to this. So it's going to be the mass of the anvil, and then here we have the forging hammer or the top that's stuck to it. Now this is already simplified down for us. They give us that K and they give us the C right away. So that means that in our model, actually some information, again, is already given to us. The K, we are told it has a stiffness of this five mega newtons per meter. And I'll put everything in base units here. And we are provided that the damping coefficient or damping constant is 10 kilonewton seconds per meter. So again, I'll put that into base units to work with. I am given the mass of the anvil, um, M, or is what I want to find. We're told that it has a weight of five kilonewtons, but I want to work with mass here because that I want the mass for my model. So if it has a weight of five kilonewtons, I can divide that by gravity and I can find that it is going to have a mass then of about 510 kilograms. So pretty massive anvil that we're dealing with here. And the mass of the hammer, which I will put an H there so that we don't confuse it later with our equivalent mass. We are told that it has uh, the top or the, is going to have a weight of one kilonewton. So again, dividing through by gravity, 9.81, it's going to have a mass of about 102 kilograms. Also pretty massive here, but this is for uh, a forging operation. So everything is going to be pretty heavy uh, dealing with this manufacturing. All right, so we know from our picture, we don't need to go through Lagrange's equations in this. Again, it will be pretty straightforward. So that means little m, which will be my equivalent mass, is going to be, once they stick together, it's the sum of these two values. So 612 kilograms. The modeling step in this one, like the last one, is not going to be too tricky uh, because it's already kind of abstracted down to a simple spring mass damper for us. So now we can assemble the equation of motion based on our model. It's one degree of freedom because we're saying that it can only travel vertically. We've defined vertically as positive down. Uh, it has a spring, it has a mass, and it has a damper. We already have their equivalent values. So we know the equation of motion is going to look like 612 x double dot plus 10,000 x dot plus 5 million x equals zero. Once they impact, there are no external forces. It is just going to move based on its initial conditions. Now again, we have to think of how are we defining the system or how are we defining time equals zero in our system. 
like the undamped problem that was similar to this, time is going to begin immediately after that impact. Because before the impact, there's no oscillations in the system. We have, uh, in this problem, we have this hammer is going to be in free fall and the anvil is stationary. That's not an oscillations problem. That's not a vibrations problem. The vibrations part starts immediately when they're impacted and they stick together. So this equation of motion is good only for time zero and beyond. Again, we're defining time zero at the moment of impact. So we want to identify the type of system we have so that we know what is the solution to x of t going to look like. And we identify it based on the equation of motion. All right, so if we look here, uh, we it's one degree of freedom. X is the only in, uh, dependent variable here. It is free vibration because our right-hand side is zero. We have a homogeneous ordinary differential equation. And it's going to be damped because we have an x dot term. And we should put here, too, just for good measure, it's linear, although we're really not going to know what to do if we were to encounter a nonlinear problem. But it's linear which narrows down what the solution looks like. Right, so we've identified it as a damped system. However, we have to remember that in damped systems, there's a couple possibilities. It could be undamped, critically damped, overdamped, and the solution is going to look a little bit different uh, depending on which one it is. We don't know yet if it's over, under, or critically damped, so that's the first thing we're going to want to look at. Let's look at our parameters, and that'll give us that last bit of information we need so that we can see what type of system are we dealing with. All right, so always with a one degree of freedom system, really any system, but it's always going to be the same calculation here. The first parameter we want to look at is what's our natural frequency. Again, damped or undamped, if it's one degree of freedom, it's the square root of k over m every time. Uh, everything here is in base units. Uh, from above. So my k value is this 5 million, and that's newtons per meter, and my mass is 612 kilograms. So I'm not going to put the units down here because, again, I'm working in the base units. If I do that, I find that this system, when the anvil and the hammer are stuck together, has a natural frequency of 90.4 radians per second. Now, because it's a damped system, let's find our value of zeta. And this is going to then tell us the type of damped system we have. Right, so we're going to use that it is C over 2m times omega n. Again, these are, at this point, all equivalent values. Once we're done with the modeling step, C, m, and k are just the equivalent values. So we're going to have 10,000 is our value for C. Again, that was in Newton seconds per meter. We're in base units time over two times the mass times the natural frequency that we just found. And doing that, we find that it is 0 0.0904. All right, that is between zero and one. So that is going to tell us we have an underdamped system. So I should go up here. Now that we know that, I'm going to put a note here that we have an underdamped system, which means now we know what the solution should look like for a one degree of freedom system with free vibrations that's underdamped and it's linear. And we know from the notes now that we've identified it that it should have a form that looks like this. Some amplitude we're going to find times e raised to the negative zeta omega n times t, uh, which we'll be able, we actually know zeta and omega n right now, but I'll save putting in the details, times the cosine of the damped frequency times t minus phi. So again, we need to, through the parameters and our initial conditions, we need to find phi and we need to find x to fill in the rest of these details. Uh, but while we're in the parameters here, uh, we also can find the damped frequency because that is going to be applicable to underdamped systems like this it is going to be the natural frequency times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. I now know the natural frequency. I now know zeta. 
Zeta is pretty small. Uh, the damped frequency is 90 radians per second. So pretty close to the natural frequency in this case. All right, I now need to find x, I need to find phi. Uh, we know what form they're going to take uh, because again, we've already solved this problem once in general. Now we need to find specific values. So we can move on to our initial conditions because we're going to need to know those in order to know uh, how to find x, how to find phi in the next steps. Okay, so first, uh, let's start with, at least calculation-wise, the easier one. What's the initial position? So what's x naught? Uh, we have, a, again, a similar situation to what we had in the undamped uh, version of this one, where initially the anvil is up here before everything connects. And it's in its own equilibrium position. However, we are starting our system or defining our system at time zero as the two pieces connected to each other. So the anvil was its, in its own equilibrium position initially. However, when the two pieces are connected, this system is not. It wants to be down here because it is more massive. So this is the actual equilibrium position for our system, but initially it's up here. So same idea that we had before, and we define x from the equilibrium position. Right? So it is above its equilibrium position by some amount delta that we want to find. And we can do that because it's going to be that delta, that change in force over k we can use like we did in the previous version of this problem. So that's going to be the change in mass times gravity. Well, originally, when it was up here, it was in its equilibrium position when the mass was only big M, but now it's big M plus the mass of the hammer. So this would be the mass of the hammer times gravity over K. Right, so that's 102 times 9.81, which is just the weight of the hammer, which we were given, uh, divided by, we have a spring constant of 5 million. Right, so that delta there, is going to be 0 0.0002 meters. And that means that our x naught, because we are starting above our equilibrium position, must be a negative 0 0.0002 meters. Negative because it's in the negative x direction as we've defined it. So pretty similar to what we saw in the last example, we are starting above our equilibrium position for that combined system. Now let's look at our initial velocity. Right, so it is going to be a little bit different than in the previous example because here our system, our anvil starts at rest and so does the hammer is starting at rest, but we're going to release the hammer from rest two meters above the surface and then it's going to impact, and then we are going to have a perfectly inelastic collision. The hammer and the anvil are going to combine their masses and stick together. So what we need to look at here is what is the velocity of the hammer right as it strikes the anvil? Because in, in that sense, it's similar to the first problem we looked at where we can do a conservation of momentum because we know initially the velocity of the anvil. If we know the velocity of the hammer right before it strikes, momentum will be conserved in that collision because they'll stick together. So the first thing we need to know is what's the velocity of the hammer when it strikes the anvil? So I'll just recreate our picture over here. So it's starting at rest and it's dropping by two meters. It's just going to be in free fall. So we can have here uh, I'll have one and time one and time two. So at time one, um, during this free fall, right before the collision, energy in our system will be conserved. So all of the energy, if we establish in this picture, this is our datum line, all of the energy initially, right before we release the hammer, is potential energy. So that's going to be MGH. And I'll define this as h. 
All right, so this is at time one, right before we release the hammer. And then time two is right before the hammer impacts the anvil. Well, it's at the datum line, the surface of the anvil. So all of its energy at this point is going to be in kinetic energy. So one half times the mass of the hammer times the velocity of the hammer squared. All right, so again, this is the velocity of the hammer right before the impact. Uh, so actually the mass of the hammer is going to cancel out here. So I will have 9.81 times two meters equals one half times the velocity of the hammer squared. So that means that since energy is conserved, we're assuming uh, air resistance is going to be negligible and there's not going to be losses as it's falling. Then the velocity of the hammer right before the impact, we're going to get a value of 6.26 .6 meters per second right before it strikes the anvil. All right, so that's the conservation of energy part is while the hammer is in free fall. Uh, now, we have to look at the collision. Right? So right before the collision, the hammer is going to be, well, now we know, at going at 6.26 .6 meters per second, and the anvil is stationary. And then right after that impact, they're going to combine, and they're going to travel together at some uh, initial, uh, some velocity two. Right, so the hammer is moving, but the anvil is not. Then they collide, and then the system is going to move. So conservation of momentum is what we'd use in the second part. So VH MH plus V anvil M is what we used for the mass of the anvil before, but it's not going to matter because VA is zero, equals MH plus M, the total mass of our system, times what I'll call for right now V2. So the momentum of the hammer is its mass of 102 kilograms times its velocity of 6.26 equals, I'll ignore this zero part, the total mass of the system was 612 after they combine times V2. So solving this, V2, which is the velocity of the system right after the impact, we are going to get a value of 1.04 meters per second. Putting it back into the terms we want for our initial conditions, that means that x dot naught is positive 1.04 meters per second. So initially, because the hammer is traveling in the positive x direction initially, then there's that inelastic impact and they combine. Initially, the system is traveling also in that positive x direction. So we want to again be cautious on the signs. This is positive, whereas our initial position because it is above our equilibrium position, it's in the negative x direction, is going to be negative. All right, so we have our x dot naught value of positive 1.04, and we have our initial x naught value of negative 0 0.0002 meters. Now we can start to assemble our solution because now we can find the amplitude and the phase based on this being an underdamped system. Uh, so recall that the way we find x here is going to be x naught squared omega n squared. We now know both of those terms, plus x dot squared, plus two times x naught x naught dot zeta omega n. And all of that will be divided by omega d. So in the parameter step, we found omega d, omega n, and zeta. In the initial condition step, we found x naught and x naught dot. So we can put this all together here, and we'll verify its value again in, math, in MATLAB. But we get 0 0.0116 meters as the value of x. Now we can calculate the phase phi. So we're going to use the four quadrant arc tangent of the x naught dot plus zeta omega n x naught over x naught omega d. So again, we have all of our initial conditions found. So we can plug in the values and we're going to find that the phase 
is going to be 1.59 radians. With the amplitude and the phase found, now we can assemble and get our total solution here. So our x of t is going to be this x, 0 0.0116 times e to the negative 8.2t times the cosine of 90t, the damped frequency times time, minus the phase we just found, 1.59. And then this is going to be measured in meters. So this is our complete closed form solution for x of t. Now we can take this result and we can put it into MATLAB and we can plot it and see graphically what's happening. So we can put in all of those given parameters here of the spring constant and everything. Uh, let me just verify some of the calculations we did, uh, just to make sure that that all worked correctly. Yeah, so our omega n, square root of k over the, what I'm calling MEQ in line 37, so 90.4, that's our natural frequency. Our zeta value, 0 0.09, and our damped frequency of about 90. A little bit of rounding here. Okay, so x as it's defined, this is again from our pre-made solution. We already know what the value of x should be. And we get that 0 0.0116, at least that I wrote. I'll keep more digits of precision in MATLAB. They'll be pretty close to what we had before. And then using that arctan2 to find the phase. And we get that 1.59 radians. So again, we want to make sure we're using arctan2 to make sure that we are in the correct quadrant uh, for when we assemble our full solution. Right? And then in 54, I'm using the function uh, plugging in all my values, and this is what the pre-made solution looks like, and I'm using here an inline function to do so. Right? So x looks just like what we have for the pre-made solution that we already know, but now we have the parameters that we just found out. So I'm going to plot this over five cycles, so five damped periods, just to see what uh, this is going to look like. And I'll run this whole thing. And this is what the plot looks like. Remember, again, a positive x means that we are below the equilibrium position because I define x as positive down in this case. And I'm plotting this in millimeters just so that we have units that we can uh, understand a little bit better. So let's just make sure it's doing what we think it should be doing. So what's happening at time is equal to zero? We have a y value of negative 0.2. Remember, this is in mill millimeters, and this does match what our initial position should have been at 0 0.0002 in the negative x direction. So we are getting the right value here for our initial position when we are above the equilibrium position. And then we see that we have these oscillations due to that cosine term, uh, and we have this exponential decay. Those peaks, those valleys, keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and going towards zero. Eventually, in this autonomous system, all of the energy will be dissipated by the damper, and eventually we will just have our anvil and mass uh, go to its equilibrium position where x is equal to zero. And if we just wanted to double check, we can find that the timing between these peaks should be our damped period. So we can do a rough estimation here. So it should be 2 pi over omega d. So they should be about 0 0.07 seconds apart. So let's see if we get close to that. So our x value here, 0 0.0865 is, one, is a peak. And its previous peak is at 0 0.0165. Make sure I got that right. 0 0.0165. Right. And we see the difference is 0 0.07. That's very close to the 2 pi over omega d. So yes, we are seeing that time between peaks is that damped period. And that should be expected because that is going to, that's related to the frequency of the oscillation which is the damped frequency 
That's the frequency inside that cosine term. So again, just as a quick review, uh, we did our modeling step to get our equivalent m, k, and c, which for this, the modeling step was pretty straightforward. We didn't need to go into depth with Lagrange. Everything was uh, either provided to us or it was already basically a simple spring mass damper system. We then assembled our equation of motion based on that simplified model. Again, just a, a spring mass damper system that's autonomous, no external forcing. And we got our equation of motion. We then identified what type of system we had based on the equation of motion. We said it was one degree of freedom as X was the only dependent variable. Our right hand side was zero, so we have free vibrations. It's damped because we have a non-zero coefficient in front of X dot and it's linear. Now we have to go into a little bit more detail so that, to know what our solution is going to look like when we have a damped system. So we went through the parameters, found our natural frequency and our damping ratio. Since the damping ratio was between zero and one, we could fill in that missing piece and identify and know we had an underdamped system. So any one degree of freedom free underdamped system that's linear is going to have the same general solution that we wrote out here, an exponential times a cosine. But we needed to find the amplitude and the phase. So next we went to the initial conditions and figured out what the initial position of x was and the initial velocity on x was. In this case, we had to go through a couple of physics steps to get it, just based on the scenario and the information provided to us. Then we were able to assemble our full solution because we knew the definition of x and phi for this type of system. So again, filling in the gaps uh, that we now have with the initial conditions and our parameters, we were able to assemble our full solution, our full closed form solution for the oscillations in this problem.